Is it the sun, after all, that's driving climate change? Some people think the warming that we've seen is caused by solar activity. Some people think we're due to hit a grand solar minimum, which may be even worse than what's projected for global warming. What's the evidence for and against? Let's discuss. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. In at least one sense, all climate change is driven in some shape or form by the sun. Because apart from some thermal energy arising from the molten heat of the planet's core, all of the warming energy that appears on the planet comes originally from the sun. Everything else, whether it's greenhouse gases, cloud cover, the reflectivity of the ice, it's about the factors that hold on to that energy while it's here or else lets it slip away back out into space. Our standard explanation for the current process of climate change looks like this. The Earth always settles at energy balance so that the energy being received from the Sun matches the energy being re-radiated back out into space. Increased greenhouse gases hold on to that energy, meaning that the Earth warms to the point where it begins to radiate out sufficient energy to re-establish the balance, at which point things stabilise with the Earth at a hotter temperature. This has been held to be, by far, the most likely explanation for global warming because it best fits the observed changes, particularly that the lower part of the atmosphere is warming, the troposphere, while the next layer up, the stratosphere, is cooling, a phenomenon that is consistent with energy being trapped by greenhouse gases in the lower atmosphere. But of course, not everybody goes with that explanation. And another way for the Earth to potentially be heating up would be if the source of the energy was increasing. People justifiably point to all that climate variation we've seen in the past history of the planet and have raised the question, what drove change then? In particular, there's the question about the activity of the sun around the formation of what are called sunspots. These affect the amount of solar irradiance reaching the planet. And it's a question about how much influence have they had, or do they have, on the climate. The number of sunspots produced goes through relatively predictable cycles, going from almost none through to quite a few and back again. The almost none stage is the solar minimum. The quite a few stage is the solar maximum. These solar cycles take around 11 years or so. We've been paying attention to them for several hundred years and we now number them. We're into solar cycle 25. Sunspots are described as cooler areas on the sun in a region called the photosphere. You know, cooler as in 3,800 degrees Kelvin, in other words, really hot cooler only in comparison to the 5,800 degrees Kelvin of the rest of the sun's surface. And you might think that would mean that lots of sunspots would result in less energy being radiated, but it's the opposite. Sunspots happen over areas of intense magnetic activity that can release flares and coronal mass ejections. It's a process we don't fully understand, and the solar cycle also attaches to the fact that every 11 years, the poles of the sun's powerful magnetic fields flip. Since we don't fully understand it, you can't rule out the possibility that there are aspects of the process that have a bigger impact than we think, due to reasons as yet undiscovered. So you have to ask, is there evidence of a correlation between solar activity and the effects that we see in terms of climate change? If there's evidence of correlation, is that supported by evidence of causation? The two are not always the same thing. Some people argue strongly that there are significant aspects of correlation that you can't ignore. So, for instance, although the solar cycles tend to roll around every 11 years, there also seem to be larger, less predictable cycles. If you look back through history, you'll see a period where, as best as we can tell, there was minimal sunspot activity for an extended period of time a period known as a grand solar minimum. In this case, it's been labelled the Maunder minimum, and it coincided with the period in history that has come to be known as the Little Ice Age, where, as we saw in the previous video on climate change in human history, we saw some pretty severe impacts from the colder climate on crops and on human well-being. This has led a number of people to suggest that we're in for another such grand solar minimum sometime soon. 
And they say that if you analyse recent activity, there are all the signs that it's coming. Should we experience one? They say that the cooling that will come with it will cut through the recent warming and the impact on our society would be pretty severe. Others have suggested that even if that isn't on the cards, nevertheless there's good correlation between recent climatic changes and solar activity and therefore this is just part of the solar cycle that will soon reverse itself and prove all of our fears to have been groundless. Which would be lovely! First some background. The amount of energy received from the sun is relatively constant. 1,361 watts per square metre is known as the solar constant. The amount of energy reaching the top of the Earth's atmosphere, not that all of it makes it through, some of it gets absorbed on the way in by components of the atmosphere, some gets reflected from cloud cover or from other areas with high reflectivity such as ice. And although I say it's relatively constant, it changes with the point of the solar cycle that we're in, as you can see from this graph. Also, the Sun has, over the billions of years of the lifetime of the Earth, been gradually getting hotter. Around 3 billion years ago, the Sun was only 75% as bright as it is today. That's a very slow and ongoing change that doesn't really feature in this discussion. So let's start with the grand solar minimum. What makes people think that we have such a phenomena imminently about to hit us? Basically because the most recent and predicted for the next, we're seeing weakening solar cycles. Here's an extract of one of the key explanatory videos on the Grand Solar Minimum News YouTube channel. NASA has confirmed solar cycle 25. The next solar cycle is expected to be significantly weaker than that of the current cycle. NOAA has also released predictions that the next solar cycle will be the lowest we have seen in 200 years. This is also supported in Valentina Zarkova's latest research, which predicts the next modern grand minimum of solar activity between 2020 and 2055. It's true that in June last year, NASA was predicting that the next solar cycle would be the weakest of the last 200 years. However, at the end of last year, the forecast was updated and they suggested that they now expect it to be more or less in line with the previous one. So a bit stronger than they previously thought, but the last one was comparatively weak. So you're still getting two relatively weak cycles in a row, which could be the descent into a grand solar minimum, I checked out the Nature article they mentioned and found that since that video was produced, indeed just last month in fact, the paper was retracted by the editors of the journal. The retraction said this, After publication, concerns were raised regarding the interpretation of how the Earth-Sun distance changes over time and that some of the assumptions on which analyses presented in the article are based are incorrect. It explained that the authors of the paper had mistakenly not accounted for the influence of Jupiter and the other giant planets on creating a correlation in the movements of the Earth and the Sun and concluded, as a result, the editors no longer have confidence in the conclusions presented. One of the authors accepted the withdrawal, the three others disputed it. What we're left with is really pretty weak evidence that there are signs pointing to an imminent grand solar minimum. The advocates argue that we've got a couple of weaker than usual solar cycles taking place, which could augur the big changes to come. But if we go back to that 400 year graph, the previous Maunder minimum was not led into by gradually decreasing cycles. It came along as a fairly sudden hit. So it doesn't offer a distinctive approach pattern that we can now see today. And with all the variability that you can see in those cycles, there are certainly other periods where there were a couple of weaker cycles together that didn't turn into anything significant. We know that there is a broadly consistent solar cycle of 11 years. But what about these major events, the grand solar minima? Do they follow a regular pattern? So could we identify whether we're due for one? And the answer is not that you can easily detect. You could say that after 400 years, it's kind of about time for another one, but there are numerous periods a lot longer than that. Now, all that means is we don't know. People running scare stories that one is definitely imminent are short on evidence. But in the same way that Bill Gates was predicting another pandemic sometime soon, just a few years ago, the fact that you don't know exactly when something is coming doesn't mean it's not coming.
So then the question really becomes, what happens if it does? Does it mean that we're doomed to relive the Little Ice Age of a few hundred years ago? And how bad would that be? There would be, I'm sure, plenty of people that would enjoy that prospect right at the beginning, seeing the discomfort of the most ideologically committed campaigners on global warming. But given some of the bad consequences the human race endured during the Little Ice Age, the enjoyment might well be short-lived. Be careful what you wish for. I suppose the first question is, do we know whether or not it was the Maunder Minimum that actually caused the Little Ice Age? As we saw in the history video, the Little Ice Age began quite abruptly around 1275-1300 and then had a significant acceleration between 1430 and 1455. If we compare with the Sunspots timeline, the start of that period demonstrably predates the Maunder Minimum. According to the 2012 paper by Miller et al, the Little Ice Age cold periods coincided with some of the most energetic volcanic activity of the last millennium. Volcanic activity is something we've seen time and time again as a factor in influencing the climate, so that's not unusual. Our results suggest that the onset of the Little Ice Age can be linked to an unusual 50-year-long episode with four large sulphur-rich explosive eruptions each with a global sulphate loading greater than 60 teragrams. Large changes in solar irradiance are not required. The paper said that the onset of the period was triggered by volcanoes, but was then sustained by sea ice and ocean feedbacks. And that would intuitively make sense, because although, as we've seen, the solar cycles do make a difference to the amount of solar irradiance reaching the Earth, if you look more closely at the graph, you see that the fluctuations are only a tiny amount of the full quantity of solar irradiance. The difference comes to about a quarter of a watt per square metre from the solar constant of 1361 watts per square metre. Now, of course, we shouldn't automatically dismiss the idea that a small change could be leveraged into a larger one. After all, I'm forever in discussions with people about the fact that a relatively tiny amount of CO2 in the atmosphere can have such an important impact on climate change. Nevertheless, the scientists have done the research to calculate the contribution made by what they describe as radiative forcing, and it comes out as measurable, but relatively tiny, as a contribution to overall climate forcings by the various factors. This graph is from the IPCC SR5 report in 2013. And then this paper looked at the question of whether a future Maunda minimum event would cancel out current experience global warming. It fed into the models an assumption about the value of total solar irradiance during the time of the Maunda minimum, erring on the side of assuming a larger likely impact rather than a smaller one. And they showed that such an event might slow future warming, but it wouldn't stop it. And once the period had passed, the expected warming would quickly catch back up to where it otherwise would have been. The graph shown gives the scenario of the IPCC's RCP 4.5 amount of warning, but the point is whichever trajectory it would be on, the amount of difference to the trend would be about the same. Definitely not a new mini ice age, and not enough to cancel out the warming that we're seeing as a result of climate change. Unless, of course, you think that recent warming has been the result of the sun and not of greenhouse gases in the first place. If it's been the sun all along, then obviously it might make a much bigger impact. So we need to look at that. And it's a position that starts with some credence. A paper by Solanke et al. in 2004 suggested that we have recently been in a period of unusual activity from the sun when seen from the perspective of the last 11,000 years. It said this, According to our reconstruction, the level of solar activity during the past 70 years is exceptional, and the previous period of equally high activity occurred more than 8,000 years ago. We find that during the past 11,400 years, the sun spent only of the order of 10% of the time at a similarly high level of magnetic activity, and almost all of the earlier high-level periods were shorter than the present episode. Well, that sounds very interesting. But the authors burst the bubble with the very next sentence. Although the rarity of the current episode of high average sunspot numbers may indicate that the sun has contributed to the unusual climate change during the 20th century, 
We point out that solar variability is unlikely to have been the dominant cause of the strong warming during the past three decades. Various papers have shown a degree of correlation between solar irradiance and temperature anomalies. For instance, this graph from Solanke again and Flig from 1999. So you might look at that graph and seriously ponder why Sami Solanke, lead author of both papers and the director of the Max Planck Centre for Solar System Research, came to the conclusion that he did. He returned to that theme for this paper, specifically aiming to address the question of whether solar variability could explain global warming. The authors decided to study the question without using any form of computer modelling. They took the assumption that the Sun had been responsible for all climate change between the period of 1856 and 1970 so that the solar impact would be given its maximum possible importance. Then they used that assumption to estimate what fraction of the relatively steep temperature rise since 1970 could be due to the influence of the Sun. It's an approach that's designed to identify what would be the maximum percentage rather than trying to work out from the history what were actually the contributions of the Sun vis-a-vis -vis any other potential historical causes. It noted that there were three possible ways that solar irradiance could influence temperatures. There could be heating of the lower atmosphere directly because of changes in the total solar irradiance. In other words, the Earth got hotter because the Sun got hotter. There could be changes in the chemistry of the stratosphere influenced by changes specifically in the UV solar spectrum or there could be changes in cloud cover affected by cosmic ray flux, where the energy of incoming cosmic rays is affected by solar activity. I'm not going to go into the detail of how the latter two work. There are other potential ways that solar activity could affect the climate. Having done that, they came to the conclusion that the sun could not have contributed more than 30% of the post-1970 temperature rise, and that was regardless of which of the three mechanisms you thought to be the dominant factor. This graph shows the breakdown of the correlation in the later years between irradiance and temperature, and it's broadly the same for the other aspects of how the sun could have contributed. And this does seem to be the key problem with the solar forcing argument, notwithstanding the other evidence in this paper. The correlation identified by those previous papers breaks down for the most recent decades. Solar activity in the last few decades has been going down, part of a natural variability within that extremely billions of years long-term warming trend. But temperatures have continued to climb. And there remains one other problem. At the start, I mentioned what we see happening, which is that the lower atmosphere is warming, but the mid-atmosphere, the stratosphere, is cooling. Even had the studies not concluded that solar activity could not be driving the recent warming, it's still the case that any of the scenarios would not have matched that observed reality, as well as the explanation due to greenhouse gases does. Now, is that the last word on the matter? It's highly influential. Perhaps it's not the very last word. There's still a lot we don't know about the sun. There are complexities to be discovered for sure in some of the related phenomena, such as the solar influence cosmic rays and events such as solar coronal mass ejections. As we study such questions more, I'm sure there will be more interesting and fascinating surprises to come. Will any of them suddenly overturn what we think we know about the causes of climate change? Almost certainly not, but nothing's impossible. What seems to be pretty solid is that the simplistic contention that recent climate change is driven by standard solar variability has been shown not to be the case.